right, welcome back to another episode of Shifting Schools. So great to be here with Trisha today as we launch our mini series on SEL or social emotional learning. Trisha, I think this is the perfect time of the year to be talking about how are we setting up the structures in our classroom around this thing called SEL that we know we are focused on? Uh, we are still very heavily focused on it, as we always should be. Uh, coming out of the pandemic is we're constantly trying to you know, bring kids back into the fold. And, and we're, we're talking about all the things that have happened over the last couple of years in schools. And I think this is a great episode to kind of kick off our mini series all about social emotional learning. That's right. You know, I, I think social for schools, is there a more important dynamic than that child, parent, caretaker, teacher dynamic? And today's guest gives us so much advice and guidance in terms of really cultivating a strong relationship there and how that's going to drive learning. Um, Jessica Leahy is the author of the book, The Gift of Failure, How the Parents Learn to Let Go so their children can succeed. And she just drops so much wisdom. No, no. Um, you know, I, I really appreciate she talks about from the start of the school year, what can we do to perhaps focus more on goals, less so than grades, um, and how we can, of course, really be thinking about failure as not just a necessary part of the process, but perhaps like where the sweet spot of learning is at. Um, what, what stood out to you from our conversation today, Jeff? Well, I think it was very interesting. She talks about, you know, she wrote these, she wrote these books and they are, you know, the titles of them talk about for parents and caregivers. And she even admits, she's like, I actually, I think they're more for educators than they are for the parent community. And I think that's part of the wisdom that she drops here today. You know, everything that we talk about today isn't new. There's nothing in here that is new. The ideas in here are just things that we need to remember and based in the research that she has done, like the things that we share in this podcast, the things that the wisdom that she's dropping is based in research that she's done and in the consultancies that she does with school districts. And I love this idea. And you know my where I stand on this, but this idea of positioning failure. And I love that, Trisha, that you came up with that. How do we make sure from the beginning of the school year, we are supporting our kids in understanding, understanding that failure is a part of the learning process. And I am here to support you in the learning process. But we all, we all are going to fail at some point this year. And it's what you do with that failure that makes you be successful afterwards. And I think that to me, when we talk about emotional learning is understand the emotions that go with that and understand that those emotions lead to the struggle that we call learning. And that to me, I think is a huge part as, as we roll out this mini series, you're going to, I'm sure going to hear this throughout all of these episodes. Um, but just, you know, when we're talking about that, how are we setting up the structures in our classrooms that support things like talking about uh, growth over grades, talking about failure, we need to make sure that that is a key component to our classroom culture. If that is something that we truly want kids to get out of it, if we don't set it up and we don't talk about it in our classroom, it's not going to just happen. And I think that's one of the things that we just have to remember as we're setting up classroom cultures this year. And, and again, I, I would say, what are we doing, you know, just to push back gently on what you said, the ideas aren't necessarily new to us. Like Jeff, you and I have been supporting learning and students for decades, but for parents and caretakers who I think have been misinformed, mm. you know, sometimes I feel like rigor has been misused or people feel like they have to hold perfection as the standard. You know, I have coached and worked with some parents. I know you have too, where they think like, if I am just the firmest disciplinarian, my child will catch up with that. And I'm, I'm going to quote from the introduction of Jessica's book where she writes, decades of studies and hundreds of pages of scientific evidence point to one conclusion that sounds crazy, but it absolutely works. If parents back off the pressure and anxiety over grades and achievement and focus on the bigger picture, a love of learning and independent inquiry, grades will improve and test scores will go up. And I do mm. think for parents, caretakers, yeah. for many of them, that will be brand new. And schools, yeah, like, what are you doing to inform parents and caretakers? And I think, I really do think we have to give them multiple entry points into learning about that. Um, so this is a book that I think for schools that have parent caretaker book clubs, 
highly, highly would recommend this text for that mm. because I, I think there's some unlearning that parents and caretakers need need to take on in terms of like what what's going to support motivation for your child because there's been I think a lot of bad advice yeah. out there. Well, I think you you bring up a great point. I mean, if you have a PTA or a PTO at your school who does book clubs like this, what a great way. And how cool would it be that if the PTA or PTO was reading the same book as the teachers? Yeah. Like what if we started to break down those, you know, that parent guardian educator so that we're all understanding here what the science says behind motivation, what the science says behind learning, uh, which is really what what the book is is about, right? Is supporting is supporting kids, and that's what we're all in the business of doing. As your parent, guardian, as an educator, we're all here for the kiddos and trying to uh, you know support them in what they do. So I love that, Jeff. Uh, I would say too, you know, if if you do have that PTA PTO, uh, take the link to this episode and share it with them. Um, yeah. I, I think that that might help drive some curiosity around this conversation and the book. Let me tell folks a little bit more about our special guest. Jessica Leahy is the author of the New York Times bestselling book, The Gift of Failure. That's what we're here to discuss today. Over 20 years, Jess has taught every grade from sixth to 12th in both public and private schools and spent five years teaching in a drug and alcohol rehab for adolescents in Vermont. She has written about education, parenting, and child welfare for The Washington Post, The Atlantic, and her bi-weekly column, The Parent-Teacher Conference, ran for three years at The New York Times. She designed and wrote the educational curriculum for Amazon Kids' award-winning animated series, The Stinky and Dirty Show, and was a 2019 Pushcart Prize nominee. Wow. Yeah, she's she's done a lot of things. So we're we're humbled and honored to have her here on the show and hope that this episode is useful for our educator audience and, and perhaps uh, for them to pass on to some of the par parents and caretakers that they're working and partnering with this year, too. All right. And with that, here is Jessica Leahy, the author of the New York Times bestselling book, The Gift of Failure, How the Best Parents Learn to Let Go So Their Children Can Succeed. So excited for this conversation. I actually have my copy of your book here with me, um, in part because I wanted to actually start this conversation with a quote from your book, The Gift of Failure. And readers who have your copy or picking up your copy, uh, this is coming to us from page 36, where you write, quote, encourage competence in your child whenever possible competence and mastery are incredible motivators, end quote. Can you say more to our listeners about the power of cultivating an appreciation for competence? I love this question because I would have given you one answer when I first wrote this book, but I have since written a book about preventing substance use in kids. And this question has taken on a whole other life because this competence piece is so important, not just for learning and motivation and engagement in schools, but it's incredibly important for preventing substance use in kids. Um, so competence and confidence, I talk a lot about the difference between those two things, you know, confident kids, great, whatever. There's a lot of optimism. I love optimism. I'm a very optimistic person, but confidence is this like you know, this sense of like, oh, it's going to be fine, right? Either because my parents said it's going to be fine or, you know, I'm just, I, I have this feeling that it's going to be okay. Whereas competence is confidence based on actual skills, skill building, having things that you have tried and mastered and um, you have a sense that you can do that thing. You're building on that past library of skills that you've built, which for learning is so important. Um, it allows students to rely on themselves to, they get a little bit more um, through that process of becoming competent. They learn how to feel frustrated and not flip out and sort of, um, you know, manage that difficult emotion. I hate being frustrated too. From the perspective of substance use disorder, though, one of the best ways we can help kids get, a, you know, a boost of dopamine is in the brain is through mastering something. Um, you know, kids are especially they're depending on their personality type, you know, kids are just craving those dopamine hits. We all want that next great, you know, post or that, you know, that like or whatever that thing is. And that gives us dopamine. But so does building something, a skill in yourself. And hmm. I think one of the things that we have leaned towards in the past couple of years has been 
you know, the easy dopamine hits of the next social media post or whatever. Um, but these dopamine hits that are built through, you know, struggle and mastery are lasting, not just from the perspective of a, here's that dopamine you get in that moment, but from the perspective of each time I am reminded that I know how to do that thing. It's an additional hit of dopamine, which is, you know, really, really important for helping kids understand that you can, um, you can access that rush of that feeling of, you know, all that good stuff that dopamine gets, gives us, we can, we can get that from ourselves if we'll just let kids, you know, become competent and not just confident. Well, and I, I appreciate, you know, you bring up this journey towards competence because I think that word has a lot of weight to it. And, um, you know, there are small ways and you might laugh because my wife is away on a work trip this week. And a thing that I have been wanting to do all year is actually just reorganize our sock drawer. Um, <laughs> my dog, if my dog gets a hold of a sock, there are holes in it. It's, you yeah. know, but it's like, I've just been putting those back in the sock drawer. And, you know, for months now, it's been like on my mind, just reorganize it. And of course, when I finally did it this week, it took 15 minutes. You know, I had been like stressing over this thing that it, I, I had loaded up actually a new audio book to listen to during this chore. And I'm like, I didn't even get through the introduction <laughs> of the book. <laughs> um, and so you talk a lot about, you know, parents, caretakers letting go of perfection in order to let their children like actually support the household, mm -hmm. right? Get involved yeah. at that level. Um, and I really appreciate though, that you talk about how it isn't easy. You know, you reference like that, that idea of letting go, of course, is tremendously hard. And mm -hmm. the book itself has lots of advice, but I'm wondering if you want to just talk about some of the, mm -hmm. you know, when we talk about developing competence, it doesn't mean like, you know, I, I mean, literally, I did feel a, a boost of dopamine yeah. after I finally did that chore, but all it was was 15 minutes. Right, right. For me, uh, you know, this dopamine question is uh, really important to me, mainly because I'm in recovery. I'm an alcoholic. I just uh, just celebrated my 10th year of recovery. And that, to me, has been a journey of learning to rely on myself for my own sort of, you know, my own highs. And, you know, mm. that that part of, uh, I highly recommend, by the way, if anyone wants to understand more, more about dopamine, to read Anna Lemke's book, Dopamine Nation. It's a really important mm. book, I think, for people just to understand themselves, to understand their kids, whatever. But this whole process of, with the whole competence thing, you know, I have two kids and, Every single time, and you know, lots and lots of students that I've taught over the years, but every time I start thinking about this, you know, this journey to competence, and I start losing sight of the big picture, and I'm focused on the moment and how I want something done, and I want it done perfectly and not the way they're doing it. And I have to think over and over and over again, you know, do I want this done perfectly right now in this moment, or I do I want my kid to be able to do it themselves next time? And mm -hmm. ditto with my students, right? I don't want those students. There's a, there's a through line here because the kids who are having trouble relying on themselves and the kids who aren't allowed to sort of pitch in at home and be a part of a working household are also the kids who tend to like, you know, you hand something out in class and their hand goes up in the air before they've ever even looked at the instructions because they're so positive that they're stuck already before they even take a breath. So all of that is tied together. And the last part of this, I think that's really important is when we talk about competence and we talk about building that sense of, oh, oh, no, wait, I, I can do this. I can rely on myself. It's so much more important than that task there in that moment. Um, it's about building that self-reliance for later. It's about obviously the dopamine thing we've been talking about. And it's about that sense of, oh no, you know, I don't need to look to someone else for that. Um, you know, you know, when our kids come to us and they're like, do you like this picture? What do you think of this picture? We automatically are like, oh, that's the best thing I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> you know, one of the greatest things that we can do is we can turn it around and say, well, 
what do you think of your picture? You know, or, you know, kid comes off the soccer field, you know, how did I play? And you turn around and you say, you know, how do you think you played? How do you feel about today's game? Did you have fun? Did you, was there anything you felt like you did really well today? That sense of building some internal compass, not just for Mm. that competent stuff, but for quality is so important because, you know, they're going to just, they're going to need to know not just by what everyone else says is something that they've done of worth. They need to know, oh, no, this thing I did is of worth here because I know what that means for me. And that's been mm-hmm. really, in fact, I had this conversation with another author yesterday. She's had been ha- she's had to build a pretty thick skin recently just because authors sometimes need to have a thick skin when we put stuff out there. And she said, you know, I've been able to let go of what everyone else thinks of my work because I know I'm doing some of the best work of my life right now. And that has to be enough for me right now. I can't let other people dictate whether or not my work is worthy. Mm. And that's something that we start teaching kids from a really young age. Um, if we're allowing them to, you know, weigh in on the own, their own internal vision of whether or not something's good. Mm. I really like that. And I think there's so much to take away for educators who are listening to this and just that moment right there of how do you turn the question around Mm -hmm. in our classrooms to say, well, what do you think about this? Was this some of your best work? You know, you flunked the test. Well, why do you think you flunked the test? You know, well, I didn't study. Well, that's great. That's good for you to know. Or you aced the test. Why did you ace the test? Well, I studied really hard and I just, you know, I I put forth some effort and there's a reason why I'm seeing the outcome that I'm seeing. Uh, And I think that's something very critical to be thinking about. That the, the two places I was just thinking about in schools where that opportunity is just opened wide for you is number one, student led parent teacher conferences. Mm-hmm. That is like I love that. the best ones, in my opinion, the best parent led, sorry, student led parent teacher conferences are um, Freudian slip there, um, are the ones where we ask kids not just to come up with examples of their best work to show off during that meeting, but to say, also, I want you to pick an example of something that really, where you really learned a lot. And that thing can be something that you did terribly on because that's going to show us where you grew. And, you know, I talk, I've talked about this in a bunch of interviews. When we um, moved here to Vermont from New Hampshire, we, I was in charge of sort of figuring out the schools and, you know, what school does what and all that other kind of stuff, you know, years of education journalism sort of put me in that seat. And the school that I picked, the school district that I picked for our kids was a school that uses um, standards-based assessments and formative assessment, lots of standards-based stuff, you know, like, okay, do they actually know the skills? Yes or no. And sure. those formative assessments have been an incredible opportunity because formative assessments, for those of you in the audience who don't understand fully what those are, it's, you know, frequent low stakes assessments that teachers or parents can give their kids to understand what they know and what they don't know so that when you do those big summative assessment, there are no surprises. But the best thing about the formative assessment is if a kid tanks something, really doesn't do well on it, then the school that my daughter went to would give her this form where she needed to fill out what she thought she knew, what she didn't know, that whole metacognition stuff. Yeah. Um, where where do you feel you need help in reinforcing these skills? What can we do to help you? All of that stuff that makes her pause, think back on what she's done, understand what she did know and what she didn't know and what she overestimated and what where she sort of fell short and give that back in the form of writing to someone who can help her. That is an incredibly rich opportunity for um for that kind of growth. And so I'm a huge um, proponent of both standards-based uh, grading. Um, if you want to even call it grading and formative assessment, I, I can't, yeah. I, I can't talk about it enough. I think it's so important. Well, and I am, I am vibing with you so hard right now because that's all <laughs> I ever did as a teacher in the classroom. Yeah, I only ever did student-led conferences before they were a thing back in the late nineties, early two thousands. And we always created growth portfolios. Mm-hmm. Great. Right? You had yeah. to choose three things from EA. I was a fourth grade teacher. Three things from English that shows your growth. Three things from math that shows your growth. So you're not picking your three A's. You're picking things that 
Here's one that I struggled on. Here's how I improved. And every, every entry had a reflective slip with it that the parents then could see of the kid reflecting on, here's what I'm proud of myself of. Here was my next step. And then they flipped to their next example of, here's what I'm proud of. Here's my next step. Yeah. And the cool part was, is I got more feedback from parents saying, I've never heard my children talk about their own work this way. And that makes them proud because they know, I mean, their kids are fourth grade. They're not perfect. They're not doing algebra. They shouldn't be. They're fourth graders. But you could see those steps and you could see kids gaining. And it made parents proud to even hear their children say, I'm making strides this way. I'm not perfect yet, but I am making strides and I can celebrate my successes and also still see my shortcomings of what my next step should be. Yeah. And I think that's such a critical, critical piece to everything that we're talking about here about supporting kids as they, as they, as they grow and mature. Yeah. One of the things that was really cool was when, so both of my kids are, um, one of my kids is in college. One has graduated from college, but when the younger one was looking at colleges, you know, she's, she watched her brother go through this. She knows what our priorities are around college. It's about finding the right fit for the way they want to, what the way they want to become and learn and grow Mm. and all that sort of stuff. And, uh, she, when she was touring schools, the questions she was asking about how her learning would be supported were so great because it showed me that she had learned how she learns best. She learns best through independent inquiry with, um, uh, so the school she goes to, the college she goes to is a lot of independent inquiry, a lot of sort of a panel of sort of uh, advisors who help shape, help her shape how she's moving towards goals. It's a smaller school. She definitely needed a smaller school, but all of these things were, um, she was able to articulate that she needed that. And she was able Mm. to go through a list when she was doing all of that sort of like, Hey, welcome to so-and-so college. Uh, she was able to sort of figure out that, and the two schools she landed on were two schools that are very heavy on sort of that mode of learning. And, and it's Mm. been really, fun to watch her figure that out. I mean, for me, it was like, okay, if I've done nothing else right, I've at least helped her figure out um, how to ask for what she needs and how to recognize a learning environment that really works for her. And if it doesn't work for her, either say, no, that's not for me or work to change it. That's, you know, and so she can be successful in her life. Like if you have those skills, you're going to be successful because you can put yourself into situations that are best for you. And that to me is what we want, right? That we call that lifelong learning. If we want, we, we use this word all the time in education. We want our children to be lifelong learners. Well, that means that they need to know how they learn best. That's the only way you become a lifelong learner is if you know what you need to be successful, then it applies to university. It applies to jobs. It applies to picking a partner for life. It applies to right. so many things. This is what I need to be successful in life. And Absolutely. I think that's such a critical skill of, you know, we, we constantly focus on it in education. And I hope that if nothing else, you know, listeners out of this episode understand that, okay, uh, maybe this is something I needed to hear right now because, you know, this is coming out in the fall. I'm setting up structures in my classroom. How am I making sure that I'm getting kids reflective and being able to be confident in understanding who they are? I think that's it's such a, it's such a critical cliche piece to what K-12 education truly is about, uh, that I love it. I want to well, switch can gears I, for- Can I just, just add a, just one yeah, quick thing is I thought that The Gift of Failure was a parenting book when I started writing it. Yeah. The big joke was on me is it was in a book for teachers. I mean, I really, yes, yeah. it's for parents and all that sort of stuff. And that's how it's marketed. And that's how my publisher markets it. And that's great, whatever. This is an education book for me because my yeah. teaching changed so much after I wrote this book and after I learned what I learned about engagement, motivation, you know, how to uh, everything, I, you know, I dumped so many of the methods that I had been using that I thought I was being really thoughtful about. But a lot Mm. of the teaching methods that I was using um, just were not working best for their learning. They were working great for me for my teaching, but they were not working great for them for their learning. And so I was a very different teacher after writing Gift of Failure than I was before. Mm. I love that because I think that leads into the next question, which is, you know, your book is very clear about this idea of autonomy supported parenting Mm -hmm. and this idea that it's not that's not a free for all. But your advice for parents and caregivers is to value limits 
as structure. I love that, right? Value limits as structures. Can you walk our listeners through a little bit about an example of what that might look like? And again, I think to your point, this isn't just about parents and caregivers, but in, in our classrooms as well. Yeah, I think a lot of this sort of comes out of that idea that, you know, we know that, for example, toddlers need limits. You know, we need to say, no, 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 you can't eat that or you can't, um, you know, play with that. That's too dangerous. You can't put your hands on the stove. Those are hard limits. Right. And we're not going to like walk back and say, OK, sure, put your hand on the stove. That's probably not the best way to parent in that situation or to teach. Right. So there are limits like in a in a chemistry lab. There are limits. You know, there's no mixing two chemicals before blah, 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 blah. Um, and you wear your safety goggles and stuff like that. But within that, there is play, there is creativity, there are opportunities to sort of um, do things differently up to those limits. And I think, you know, from my classroom, there is sort of depending on how you talk about this for my kids, you know, uh, it was really important for my, my own children that they understood that most of my limits were, uh, and my rules were around safety and making sure that they're safe and that um, I'm protecting their safety when they can't do it for themselves, that kind of thing. And in my classroom, you know, we talk a lot about, um, about sort of those, those first day, like we're going to make sure that we are polite to each other, that we don't uh, denigrate each other, the respect and stuff like that. Sure. But uh, it's also really important that within that framework, they understand that that respect goes two ways. I had a student come to me once to tell me she was dropping my Latin class because she felt like the class wasn't working for her, that she wasn't learning very much. And here were her beefs with my class. And you know what? She was 100% right. And I learned a ton about what I was doing wrong in that classroom mm -hmm. and how I was not teaching to all of my students. I was teaching to a narrow slice of them. But she understood that one of the rules in my classroom is, is you don't, um, that there are learning opportunities for everyone, not just the students, that formative mm -hmm. assessments are formative both for them and for me as a teacher. If you all fail this quiz, my answer can't be what's wrong with you people. How yeah. are you people not getting all of this right? We've done this. And this was something that actually happened to me. This was a real experience. I gave a quiz three times. They all failed it three times. And I'd used that quiz for years and years. What is wrong with you people? And then it, mm. like it hadn't even occurred to me that the problem was me. Mm. It, it hadn't even occurred to me. And that's why that word formative is so important to me that, you know, the respect goes both ways. This this is formative for you as much as for me. And so if you feel like this, um, the learning is not happening in the classroom or you don't feel included or you don't feel engaged, bring that to me as well. And I think that those limits are reassuring to toddlers and teens alike. Um and understanding that there are limits is something that, you know, we have to realize as a parent is one of the most important things we do, but there has to be, you know, some room within those limits to, uh, to move and be creative and all that sort of stuff. Hmm. And I love that your book really focuses too on the way in which we communicate them. I mean, the text is really rich with lots of anecdotes, lots of stories that I think make your premise of, you know, failure being a gift kind of comes to life. And one of the communication partnership dynamics that you talk about in the book um, is the parent teacher partnership. So it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's really interesting to me that you feel like in your mind now, this is an educator book. Like I, I feel like it would be such a great school community PD text for parents, caretakers and teachers, because that partnership is tough. I don't think anybody yeah. would venture to say it's easy, but it is so essential. Um, and in your section of the book entitled Parent Teacher Partnerships, you write about protecting a child's right to fail. Mm -hmm. And I like was like cheering during that section because as an <laughs> educator, I've believed that for so long. I mean, we've already been talking in this conversation about how that right to fail that's, you know, a sweet spot for learning. And also I, you know, we all need to learn how to fail too. None of us are yeah. going to live a life where failure is absent from it. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more yeah. about uh, the right to fail and, and why we need to protect that right. And, and, you know, how does it help everybody involved in that partnership, yeah. not just one person? 
Well, to the first part of your question, so I have essentially the coolest job in the world, which is to get curious about something and go research the heck out of it and then sort of translate it for people that don't necessarily want to do all the research. So what I get to do now, most of my time is spent now um, traveling, for example, to a school. And usually what I do is I talk to the kids during the day talk to them about, I get a little conspiratorial with them, talk to them about how, wait, you know, even if you feel like you're being very, very controlled, um, here are some ways to sort of um, regain control of your own learning so that you feel like some of it is yours, because frankly, that's where you get really great engagement is when you feel they, it's their learning. Anyway, so I sort of prime them for some words, some vocabulary that they might hear later because in the afternoon I talk to the to the teachers. I do professional development sort of right after school. And then that evening I speak to the community, to the parents. And I do a couple of things. I give all of the kids my email address and I ask them, I'm like, look, I'm meeting with I'm talking to your parents tonight at seven. So between now and seven, email me with things you need for your parents to know that you feel like they can't hear because they're too defensive or because they get mad or whatever it is. And then I also teach them about I statements, like when you do X, it makes me feel Y. So that, um, mm. you know, the sort of statements that don't really lend themselves to be getting defensive kind of stuff. And then in the evening, I have the kids own words in terms of what it is they feel like their parents need to hear. And I can say, look, if your kid comes to you with a statement like, when you do X, it makes me feel Y. You need to understand that this is something they really, really, really want you to hear. And they're, this is important. And then we also have this sort of shared vocabulary, the word formative, the word um, competence, the word autonomy, all of these words I need for the parents to hear. I need for, I need the kids to hear them. I need the teachers to hear them and I need for the parents to hear them. So there's some shared platform for everyone moving forward to give the kids a little more autonomy, help them own their learning a little bit more, get engaged for the sake of the engagement. Um, and there's a whole bunch of other language in there, but it, it really does take all three of those parties to have a shared understanding about what learning is and how we get there. And if that means that I have to piss off a few parents, which always happens, um, <laughs> and I'm cool with that. I mean, often schools bring me in because I'm like, uh, for example, I was in a place where a school was moving from um, A through F grading to a more standards-based approach. And they had me come in to sort of explain to parents why this was a really good thing because the parents were flipping out. They're like, yeah. what is this thing? I don't understand it. You know, but when we can, and, and this is sort of what I also tell teachers who are like, how do I get parents to understand that this is about the learning and, and not about a grade um, is to bring everything back to process. Like mm. less talk about end product, more talk about process. This works for kids who are really, especially kids who are really anxious. The more they're circling the drain around the difference between 89 and a 91, the more we talk about process, the better. With teachers, you know, we understand it's all about the process. It's not about, you know, next week's test. It's about what do we really want you to know five years from now. And for the parents, it's just so easy to get stuck in these daily emergencies of this grade, this trophy, this pra mm. soccer practice, how many minutes did they get to play today? You know, that kind of stuff. And so to move everyone back to that idea of process and off of end product, that takes talking to everyone. You can't just talk to one side and hope that it, you know, by osmosis moves out. That's not how this stuff works. So it's really fun. It's really challenging. You know, that's three very different audiences, but one message about how important the process of learning is rather than that end product. Hmm. And I love what you're saying. I mean, it really is getting everybody on the same page, right? Students, parents, you know, children. And, the, the you know, we talk a lot about failure. And one of the, you know, as a we're all consultants here, so we understand that part of our job as consultants is to go in and, and sometimes 
for lack of a better term, piss people off because yeah. that's why you're bringing the consultant in yeah. because you can get mad at me. I'm leaving. Right. <laughs> you can yeah. be mad at me, you, you know, where a teacher can't say those things or a school cannot lay this out there. But as a consultant, you can say things and push in ways well, that, that sometimes organizations. And that includes biting the hand that feeds me sometimes because yeah, sometimes what I'm hearing as I walk around the school and talk to kids during the day and talk to teachers and blah, blah, blah. Um, what I'll often hear is, you know, I've got to push back and say, Okay, is, do you use a portal and, and is it open 24 seven? And are you giving any feedback on how it should be used? Or did you just deploy it and hope everyone yeah. would know how to use it? Or, um, you know, do you do any formative assessments or are everything, is everything you're doing big, big cumulative assessments? Yeah. Right. And why are you doing it this way? And I'm sorry to piss you off. And especially considering you're the one who paid for me to come here, but uh, your teachers, this is what I'm hearing from your teachers and from your students and from your parents. And it takes this entire community to spark change, not, j you know, one mm. teacher can't change the whole thing on their own, which is yeah. what can be one of the most frustrating things about understanding the research behind learning. And that's the other thing that's been really cool is, you know, we've really only started to understand how the human brain learns deeply in this past 30 years or so. And as that research trickles down to the people who need it the most, you know, some people learn, learn that stuff earlier than others. And if there's one teacher in the, on the whole faculty who understands the benefit of a really important idea and no one else does, they can feel like they're just shouting into the wind yeah, and it so can be true. really hard. So true. And I love this idea of failure. I, I think we forget a lot of times that we learn through failure. I mean, it yeah. really is. And failure is everything that happens. I've got this great slide that I love to you. Failure, and I love it with kids. Failure is everything that happens right before you succeed. Yeah. Right? Like you're going to fail. Like I was a baseball player. I'm going to go 0 for 10 before I go 4 for 4. Yeah. Right? And it's through the failures of going 0 for 10 that allowed me to go 4 for 4. Or my wife and I are working on a house. I'm going to electrocute myself four times before I say, you know what? You really should just shut off the breaker, right? I'm going to fail before I become successful because it's through the failure that the learning happens. And then when you become successful in that, that's the dopamine hit, right? Yeah. But pushing yeah. through that, I think a lot of times, and a lot of times we take that failure away. Uh, we take that failure. We want to, we want, don't want our kids to feel bad. We don't want them to have failure. We want them to be successful. We want that 91 and not the 89 because we want them to be successful. Well, and we and get caught up a lot in that. Uh, well, and and we take, so I feel like we take those failures away from kids sometimes. And well, and also what's so hard about that is we have this incredible reluctance to model that ourselves. Whereas, yes, so, agreed. so what's so fascinating is, um, and this is a story that only came out after Gift of Failure happened because it's about that book. So the gift of failure. Okay. I wrote an article for the Atlantic in 2013 or whatever, and it went viral. And this book sort of, I sold this book based on that viral article, why parents need to let their children fail. And I was paid a lot of money to write this book and there were, it was really high stakes and it's been sold in like 17 languages. So I'm now expected to write a book. I've never written a book before, right? I'm a journalist. I yeah. had written in like 1200 word blocks. I'd never written a 70,000 page book before. So I finished the book. I hand it in. I have fantasies that my editor is going to be like, oh my gosh, this is perfect. There are no edits <laughs> needed. What happened instead was my editor summoned me to New York. I live, I don't live in New York. And my editor summoned me to New York not good. And essentially what she said to me um, was this book in its current form is unpublishable. We can't mm. put this out there. And I think what we might need to do is hire a ghostwriter. And, you know, as a writer, this was like, I can't believe I can talk about this now without vomiting, but I, because the first couple of times I couldn't. Yeah. Um, so I said in that moment, I'm like, okay, well, I have a big decision to make because we can hire a ghostwriter and that person's name will never appear on the book. It can be a big secret, blah, blah, blah. Yep. Or I can buck up and I can listen to all the feedback about everything that's wrong with this book. And I begged for two probationary chapters. Just we, mm. it turns out we had some time to edit. We were in pretty good shape. So I, asked for those two probationary chapters. I said, give me those two chapters. Tell me everything that's wrong with this book and I will fix it. 
So I did. I had these big checklists of what to do, what not to do, all that sort of stuff. And those two chapters ended up being the whole book and we didn't need a ghost. Now, if you were to ask my kids what my proudest moment in my career is, they will not tell you that it was when that book hit the New York Times bestseller list, which by the way, it never would have done that in its first form. Mm. They will tell you that when I wrote my second book and I handed the rough draft in, there were so few edits to be made on that book that my editor talked about pushing the, re the release date up because what I had done was learned from that first book, made a system for not making the same mistake twice had a checklist I paid attention to. And so when she came back to me and said, you know, this is, you clearly have just internalized all of these mistakes, failures from the first book and have really um, learned from them. That by far the biggest moment in my entire career. And as a perfectionist, first child, uh, straight A, blah, 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 was one of the hardest things I've ever done. Um, hearing yeah. that I sucked, hearing that I couldn't do it, hearing that my book was awful, was I wanted to just curl up and die. But yeah. um, it gives me some street cred when I talk to my students about editing and how important editing is and all of that sort of stuff. And, you know, I'm, my, I'm the thing also that I'm proud of is that my, my kids know how hard that was. Yeah. Yeah. And my kids know how proud I am of that second that book, not needing yeah. that work. Yeah. And, you know, I don't want, I would prefer that be in my obituary than, you know, New York Times bestselling author. <laughs> it's, it's, that's great and everything. But the fact that I learned how to do this thing that I love so much is way more mm -hmm. important to me. It, Jessica, point. that's beautiful. And <laughs> first of all, I would never in my wildest dreams have guessed that, you know, when I, picked up a copy of your book. I couldn't put it down. It was one of those books that I read in a single sitting, sitting, setting. You would have hated the first version. <laughs> okay. It was awful. But I love that awful. you, I love that you shared that with us because I think it's such an important message. And I am so happy that I actually, I jotted down um, where you, the page that you wrote this, because I pulled it up because what you are also talking about so perfectly encapsulates what you have on page 192, which is you talk to parents and caretakers about the need to model enthusiasm for learning. And this is your quote, your attitudes towards education will be your child's attitude. Mm -hmm. And like for your kids to have seen that for you to share that with others is huge. And I need to say, you know, not everyone is at the level of writing, of course, that you are at, where they're going to have a, an article in, in The Atlantic go viral for other parents and caretakers who want to do something similar in terms of like, again, taking on this challenge. Hey, your attitude for education will become the attitude that your children have. For the, the person out there who doesn't have the, the challenge to turn a viral article into a book, can you speak to maybe some other ways that, again, we're really communicating our enthusiasm for learning for the young folks in our lives? My favorite, my starting place is um, this, in the book, I talked about the fact that we tend not to talk that much about grades in our house, but we do talk a ton about goals. And what we oh, still do, that. my kids are now 19 and 24, and we still do this. When we can get everyone together at the dinner table, whether that's on a holiday or whatever, because um, my 24 year old lives in New York now, um, we write down, I would love to do it once a season. It doesn't happen that as often anymore, but we write down three things, three goals for the coming season. And one of them always has to be a reach or challenging or painful or, you know, stretching in some way. And they're very personal. I can't have any input into my kids' goals. I can't say things like, wouldn't it be great if doing well in <laughs> math was one of your goals? That We can't do that because these things have yeah, to be very personal that. because when a goal is personal to you, if in three months, because this is the ideal situation, in another three months when we do this again, we also talk about how those that last set of goals went. You know, did how'd you do? And also with little kids, especially, well, with anyone, but especially with littler kids, you have to talk about 
you know, you can have a big, wonderful goal, but you also have to talk about the little individual steps you have to do to get to that goal. And that um, helping kids figure that uh, that out, that's called self-directed executive function when you sort of figure mm. out the small goals to the big goal. Um, that's one way we do that is I say, look, yeah, I'm, uh, this is on my list again this season. I screwed it up last time around, but who the heck cares? It was my personal goal. Our family may be the only four people who know that I didn't attain that goal. It's my goal. And then, but for parents in general, it's things like, you know, I was at a school in Texas and this woman said, can you give me a list? My kids don't like to read for pleasure. Can you give me a list of books that will make them want to read for pleasure? And I'm like, well, okay, magic list. But because she also wanted the books to be challenging. I said, first of all, I have to ask you two questions. Do your children see you read for pleasure? Because if they don't, there's nothing, no magic words I can say. There's no magic yeah, so list true. of books that I can give you that will make the, that, because if you don't prioritize reading for pleasure, how on earth is someone else going to convey that to them? And number two, I asked her, when your kids are reading for pleasure, what do they read? And she, oh, this still kills me. It still makes me mad every time I hear it. She said, well, they love those Diary of a Wimpy Kid books, but I threw those away because those are stupid. Mm. So I had to do a lot of explaining with her about literacy and about the 30-30-30 rule of 30% being easy, 30% being on reading level and 30% being above. And I had to talk to her about the fact that if you say to your child that what your child loves is stupid, not only are you taking away their, a comfort read for them, which is so important, and especially during COVID, we saw this. Lots of kids went back and watched cartoons from their childhood, read books from their childhood, because the predictability of those books gives children comfort. And the predictability... Yeah. Part of that is that knowing that you have mastery of that thing. So anyway, with this mom, I mean, essentially what she was saying was, I'm not going to role model that for them and I'm going to denigrate their choices. And that's the exact opposite of what we want to do. We want to cheer them on when they're doing the things that, um, you know, are important to us, important to us as a family in terms of learning. And sometimes that's going to mean you have to go out and do things that are scary for you. If it's learning a new mm. instrument, learning a new language, a friend of mine just learned Spanish in her fifties and her kids were so impressed by that, that they decided to try to learn a new language as well, the same language so they could all practice together. I mean, this is something that we have to do sort of every day, pick something. I have a board behind me that has little lights. It's called the everyday calendar. And it's by someone, I can't remember how to pronounce her last name. It's like Giertz, it's G-I-E-R-T-Z. And every day you, it was, she made it so that she would remind herself to meditate every day. So when she meditates, she presses the little light and it turns on and it shows that she meditated that day. And for me, I pick just one goal every single day, just one goal. I don't care what it is. It could be meditating. It could be taking a walk. It could be remembering to get up every 15 minutes while I'm writing today. Um, and then I get to light up the little light. And it's just a little way of reminding myself that every single day I have to remember that I have to challenge myself to some small thing every single day. And, and making sure my kids know I do that is part of it. I want that board. It's really good. <laughs> so you can get it. I'll send you the link for where to get it. It's not cheap, but um, Simone... Simone is someone I really respect. She, um, I have to say a bad word here, but she had a, she has a YouTube channel where she builds what she calls shitty robots. And um, her entire channel is about building things that may be useful only to her and making mm. a lot of mistakes and, you know, having lots of prototypes and making lots of mistakes. And this was a, a project that she built. She also turned a Tesla into a truck and calls it the truckla. She really wanted a Tesla truck. They didn't make them, so she made one. And she's just she's amazing. And uh, everyone yeah. should check her out on on uh, on YouTube because she's yeah. amazing. And I like what you're saying too. And I think teachers can you know reflect on that same idea of are we demonstrating with our students? So one of the things I yeah. think, just as an example, you know, when I was a fourth grade teacher, we always had well not every day, but a lot of times we had 30 minutes of silent reading, right, where you got to read your book from the library. Mm -hmm. Now, as a teacher, are you also reading a book during that 30 minutes mm -hmm. or are you like setting up that like, this is 30 minutes of reading? I'm also going to be reading a book because I need it quiet in here, too, because I'm reading a book with you. 
Or am I saying this is 30 minutes for you to be quiet so that I can go answer emails, get on my computer, check my phone, right? What is the, what's the message that you're Mm -hmm. sending to your students when we say, I want you to read for 30 minutes because I know it's good for you. And I want you to have some fun and pleasure in reading. But for me, it's time to go get work done. Remember, versus remember when I I'm said, gonna pick up a book and read with you. Do you remember when I said that I give the, all the kids my email address and then I, I tell them to email me? It's always, you know, spoiler alert, it's always like 10, eight to ten things. It's usually just these eight to ten things. There's one thing that is by far the biggest thing that they tell me. One of them though, um, that's usually buried in somewhere around three or four in terms of how often I get these requests is if I if I'm being told that I have to get off my device, that I need to spend time in yeah. the real world and off a screen, doesn't that also kind of mean that my parents should be doing that yep. too? Like where, where's this hypocrisy coming from? And that's one of the, you know, there our kids and you guys know this, our kids are watching way more than they're listening. Like they're processing yes, they what we actually do, not what we're saying to them. And so as a teacher, there were certain things I had to role model. I always had an index card on the front of my plan book. And that was always questions that need answering or looking up tonight. And if a, if I said I was going to look something up, or if I said I was going to find the answer to something or get something right the next day, I had to do it because I had to show follow through. And those little examples that we give to our kids of whether it's responsibility or, oh, that's really cool. I'm going to look that up tonight and figure that out. Or you ask the question, Robbie, over there, Robbie, why don't you look that up for us tonight? And then you can report back tomorrow and tell us what you learned. Um, And just that enthusiasm for learning. And I've said this a million times, but, you know, if you're a teacher where, You've gotten to the point where you're just coasting, where you haven't updated your lesson plan since 1972, where you've you just don't care anymore. You know, maybe it's time to get out because they're if you don't care, they don't care. I mean, it's just that simple. And it's the same thing for parenting. Thank you so much for all of the insight (laughs) for, you know, again, sharing about the book and, of course, beyond. I think the timing of this episode is positioned to sort of be a little bit of a call to action. I really like that we've come back and we've brought this to ourselves. Like the call to action for me is maybe, you know, in this new academic year, how am I going to give myself the gift of failure, right? That willingness to try experiment. And if it doesn't go well, it doesn't destroy me. It's going to present me with some new information that will be useful. Um, And I, I love what you said about, you know, the idea of, goals over grades and having that as a conversation Mm -hmm. that maybe is just literally in house. Um, So I'm going to take that on as well to really think about just sharing goals with like a small inner circle and getting curious about, uh, you know, I like that you talked to about for younger learners, like the mini steps of getting there. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's important for us too. So I'm going to get curious about my own mini steps. So Jessica, thank you so much again, folks, the book, The Gift of Failure, How the Best Parents Learn to Let Go So Their Children Can Succeed. Lots of links over there in the show notes um, to learn about that, as well as your more recent book. Jessica, thank you so much for your time today. Oh, this is all I mean, talking about education. This is one of my favorite things in the whole world. So thank you so much for the opportunity. If you enjoyed this week's episode for this series, Jeff and I are trying something out brand new. We've been hearing from our listeners that they would love to have a community where they can expand on the conversation that we had, where they can connect with other listeners. And we are so excited to announce that that space now exists. If you head over to camp, C-A-M-P dot shifting schools.com, you can join our free space where we're inviting you every single week to weigh in on a question connected to our episode. So this week, listeners, we would love to hear from you what messages you want your students to receive about mistakes and mistake making 
this year and what you're going to do to make sure that those messages are heard. So connect with Jeff and I, connect with other listeners, head over to camp.shiftingschools.com to weigh in on that conversation and to let us know your other thoughts about this week's episode. When you head over to camp.shiftingschools.com for a limited time when you join our free community, we also wanted to say thank you for you showing up there. You can take our self-paced pathway entitled Leading in the Era of AI Free. That's just for a limited time. So um, again, you join the community. That's our way of saying thank you. Listeners, looking forward to hearing you weigh in on this week's question. And we'll see you again next week.